morning. Great to see you all here, especially good to see my son-in-law and daughter here. That's the first time I got to, well, uh, introduce them as the Hoyts. I had to go into my phone. You know that when your daughter gets married, then you have to go into your phone and change your daughter's last name. That was a difficult day for me, but great to have them here. They came up to, uh, or came down, sorry, from Omaha to help celebrate Sally's birthday. I hope you all took Thursday off because to Sally, as you know, it's a national holiday. On your birthday, you get that day off. So uh, we celebrated actually uh, last night and uh, Carson, which don't tell anybody, but if you saw, since Sally posted a picture, he brought someone with him. And so she's pretty nice gal, but that was an interesting experience in and of itself. So we, of course, I did not tease him. I was very good for the most part, but we had a good time together. So I hope your weekend is going well, and uh, what a great job you kids did uh, this morning singing for us. Uh, great start to uh, thinking about who we are, um, what it is that God has called us to do. Um, I want to just again preview next Sunday. Um, Pastor Jared mentioned the, the, raci the racial reconciliation uh, seminar that's taking place this week in Hillsboro. Uh, the main speaker at that, uh, Terry Hunt, uh, he is the district minister in North Carolina. Uh, we have, I don't know how many churches are in the North Carolina district, but uh, they're all black churches. And uh, he, um, man, I've heard him speak before. He spoke at our national conference here about a year and a half ago, does an amazing job. And uh, I, when I heard he was going to be in Hillsboro, I quickly called our, our uh, national director and said, is he going anywhere on Sunday? Will he still be around? And they said, uh, nobody's asked. And I said, if we can have him, I want him here. So I, I hope you don't miss next Sunday. I mean, every week's great, but uh, his name is uh, Pastor Terry Hunt, and uh, he, just does, he just does an amazing job. So uh, we look forward to that as well. Uh, take your Bibles. This morning we are going to be... Going off, uh, off of what we, off topic. Okay, normally we've been in in First Timothy. You know, we're going through the book of First Timothy. I don't usually go um, topical sermons, right? We usually go with the book of the Bible, and then whatever the topic is that Scripture brings us, we cover it. And First Timothy, man, we've covered the first chapter, and uh, there's five more, and it just gets. Uh, more and more interesting to go. But for this week, we're in 1 Corinthians. And actually, 1 Corinthians 3.16 is the last scripture we're going to look at. So you could turn there, but just know we're, we are going from Genesis 1.1 through at least 1 Corinthians 3.16. So if you look there in your, in your uh, bulletin on the front, you will see that we, Genesis, Exodus, John, 1 Corinthians is where we're headed. So have your Bible, um, be ready to uh, follow along and move as, as we go along there. So the, there's no context and catch up. If you're just here this morning and you're like, I, I don't know what they've been studying here, uh, neither does anybody around you. Because uh, this is totally um, off topic from where we've been. And it's going to lead into, as you noticed here in, in front of us, we have, we're taking communion together this morning. And so what we're going to be talking about as far as a sacred space Okay, the sacred space that is within us, um, that's where we're headed. So I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads, um, to go before the Lord, and uh, just ask him to speak to you uh, through the time that, that we have here together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the peacefulness that is within your sanctuary, that, that we as people could gather together with a common purpose to worship you. Lord, may the, the things that we sing, the things that we say, that we think, that the words that we hear, that we process, may they continue to point back to you. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your spirit that lives within us, and how it continues to reveal to us exactly who you are and, and just the great love uh, that you have for us. Heavenly Father, we, 
we want to reciprocate that and just say back to you how much we love you. Uh, our desire is, is to live out the things that we see in Scripture, the, the, the truth, the grace, the mercy that you've given to us. May we be willing to, to offer that forgiveness, that love, that acceptance, that truth to others as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lisa stole my first question that I had for you. Because as Lisa talked about why uh, these kids uh, get together and sing each and every week, it was the same question that I wanted to ask you this morning. And that is, why are you here? Why are you here? You know, I, I love asking this question. And maybe it's because growing up in a, in a pastor's family, right, it was well, what do you do on Sunday morning? Well, I have to go to church, right? When, you're, when your dad is the pastor, right, you, do you have a choice when you're in uh, elementary school, junior high, and high school? No, you're there. You're not just there Sunday. You're there every time the door is open. And I, I wrote down some thoughts about perhaps why you're here this morning. Maybe you have to. Okay, maybe your parents said, okay, it's time to get up, and now it's time to eat, and they've walked you through the whole process of where you're sitting here this morning, right? Uh, and, and so you have to. Maybe you want to. Maybe your kids or your grandkids sang this morning. Maybe it's a tradition. Maybe you're here to hear God. Maybe you're happy. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you've come to worship, or maybe it's one and a whole bunch of those different things. There's not just one where you'd say, that's why I'm here. But God is interested in the space that you're taking this morning. He's interested in that place that you're, where you're sitting. He's interested in that space. And he's interested in that space, not just right now, but in every step that you will take this, this week. Because you see, one of the themes of Scripture that we see over and over again is that God's purpose is to dwell in the midst of his people. That is one of the themes throughout Scripture, and that's part of what we're going to be looking at this morning, is how is it that the God of the universe came to dwell amongst us? And it's looked different as we look through Scripture. How God has revealed himself how we have experienced him, and the, and the difference that that makes in our life is what we're going to be looking at. So I already mentioned that there's an outline on the, on the front of your bulletin. Uh, there's two other things that you're going to need between now and when this, when this service is done. One is, it's going to be great if you have a pen or pencil, and it's not for taking notes. You're going to need it later on. So like if, if you have a purse with you and you have like 40 pens in there, Bethany... Bethany always has pens, like lots of pens. So if you're sitting around Bethany back there, Wagner's, etc., look to Bethany. She's got pens. If you've got pens with you, you, you spread them out. Hand them out to those that are around you. Maybe you saw that, um, that little sign-in pad that, that has a pencil in there. You can steal it out of there. You can even take it. Well, I don't know if you can take it home. But get a writing utensil, Okay, if you want to take notes, you can, but then we have a, uh, an insert, and don't look at it yet, and I know half of you already did, but there's a yellow insert in there. We're going to look at that a little bit later, and we're going to use that. So those are the three things you're going to need is, is, is your bulletin, something to write with. You guys, too, over here, by the way. Yeah, up front here? Yeah, you need a writing utensil. Did you have those for him, McKenzie? Did you have writing utensils for your brother? No, don't do it. All right, so if you have those things, we're, we're going to get started because we're going to talk about why we're here and the fact that God is in the space where we meet, okay? God is in this space. And it starts, as I mentioned, in creation. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you the verse here in just a minute. In Genesis 1-1, you might already uh, have had it memorized, but we're going to look at it in just a second. But we see God in the midst of our pre presence, in his presence, from the very beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, God has been present. And that's not just true in what we believe. The Jewish people and the Israelites believe that. And also, going back to the others that lived around at the same time as, as the people of, of Israel. So the ancient worldview is that there, has been, there are gods that have been a part of creation. 
Okay, so if we look at comparative li literature, and we talked about that a few weeks ago with uh, King uh, Hammurabi and his uh, and his code that he had. Somebody mentioned that they were that they studied it here recently again in school. So that's that's awesome. You're hearing about it at school and here. Okay, so that we have we have an ancient worldview. We have a uh, perspective that we get from Scripture and, and what Israel believed. And then you also know that we have a modern view of creation as well, right? And so whether we're looking at, at the walls in a cave or we're looking in Scripture or you're looking in a textbook, you're going to get a world perspective of creation. You've seen that. You've walked through that. Uh, and we're going to look at a little bit at, uh, at that this morning and compare and contrast that as we begin it. So to begin with, uh, up here, the, the first way that, uh, that we're going to contrast this is between the ancient people that lived around the same time as the Jewish people. And the ancient people at that time, they had many gods. Okay, We've talked about that. And they believed creation came out of also the birthing of gods, that there was a beginning to the gods, that they were birthed, and that people helped to meet the needs that these gods had. So there were gods, they had a beginning, and that we as creation helped to meet the needs that these gods, we played a part in making sure that these gods were okay and making sure that they were pacified. At the same time, here are the people of Israel, and, and what we see from the very beginning, right? Genesis 1-1, what are the first four words? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created, right? From the very first words of Scripture, if you're here this morning and you're like, I'm not sure if I believe Scripture or if it's true or not, those are the first four words you've got to wrestle with. Because it's not saying that that's when God started. It says that's when the beginning started, right? In the beginning, God. God was already there. And so while the ancient worldview would have been that that was the beginning of time and that's, there was nothing before that, right? Here, God says there was a beginning. He was before the beginning, he was already there, and there was just one God. That's very different than what those that were around them would have uh, been believing. Tied to that is our second point, and that is the fact that in the birthing of those gods, in all of these gods that were coming to be, that there was chaos and there was turmoil. No God had ultimate power. And so there was always this battle between the gods. And so when a hurricane comes and wipes things out, those are gods that are mad at each other and, and they're fighting there. And then we as people have a way to interact with them and make sure we pacify them so our house doesn't get blown up by a tornado or a, doesn't get struck by lightning or however you want to fill in the blank. That's some of their thinking and their worldview perspective. Again, going then to what Israel would be believing and what was being taught to them, what God was revealing to them, was that he was taking disorder. If you look at those first few books of, of the book of Gen or first few chapters of the book of uh, Genesis, you see a movement from disorder, from chaos to order. You, you see the movement of, of there being nothing and that God creates and then that he takes this disorder and he, and he creates something beautiful and it's good. Now the second slide we're going to go to is going to compare what the people back then, Israel and perhaps the other, country, uh, other nations at that time believe, compared to a more modern view, okay? And that's C, D, and E. Israel and the modern view uh, uh, that we would look at creation. Again, as they would look at it, as Israel would look at it, as the people of that time uh, in Scripture uh, would look at creation, they saw um, creation as being something that's ongoing. God established and preserved the order, not only at the beginning, but he would that he would continue to do that. So often, in a modern view of creation, we think and talk about creation as being in the beginning. It's a one-time event, and it happened right here and right now, okay? The second point in this, uh, in the difference between a, an older perspective and our perspective now, uh, would be that Israel, in the purpose of creation, again, they, would, they saw from chaos to order. They saw that there was an assigning of roles, names that were being given to the animals, to the plants, to things that, that, uh, that lived here on the earth. A more modern view of creation would be that that matter, that 
matter was manufactured in creation, right? So whether you talk about the Big Bang or you talk about evolution or you talk about a, a God that created in a, in a certain amount of time, it's, it tends to be about where did this matter come from and how can we figure out where that, where that fits together in who we are. But we focus more not on going from chaos to order, but we, we tend to look more at the fact that, that there's a manufacturing of matter. And then the last point would be, as we look at this creation, again, whether it's Israel or any of these other nations around there, um, they saw it in a, in a bigger picture. Uh, it wasn't necessarily scientific. Um, specifically, um, they, they would have seen creation as, as the idea of God creating a place for himself to reside. Okay? So we look at creation as being the solar system and the planet and all the things within the planet. To them, there was this picture that that's a huge temple and that God was creating this place that he would come and reside and interact with those that he was creating. Okay? That was part of their, their world perspective. Again, Modern day, if you talk about and think about creation, and we have a lot of discussions, don't we, about what's the physical makeup, what's the structure of the earth, what are the scientific laws and the standards that we have to make sure can line up with what we know through science and what we see in Scripture, right? You probably have discussions with those that are around you uh, from time to time about, do you believe in a six-day creation? Do you believe in evolution? Do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? There's a lots of different scientific views of that, okay? But as far as Israel and where they were starting out with and the nations there, that wasn't as much their focus, okay? And putting it, that into perspective, uh, in uh, one of the, the uh, books that I've been reading is a man by the name of John H. Uh, Walton, and it's in a book called uh, The Old Testament Today. He says this, God's uh, revelation of himself in the Bible did not seek to change the Israelites' worldview by offering new scientific perspectives or by raising them uh, above their primitive understanding of the cosmos. No verse in the Bible reveals or assumes a level of scientific knowledge that supersedes what was known in the ancient world. So it's not like there are things in Scripture there that, that were like, oh, this is all sudden brand new. They never heard anything like that. It was within the realm that they could understand even at that time. Right? Rather than correcting or enhancing their scientific understanding, God used what they understood to clarify his role and character. Isn't that like God? That's, what, that's the God that we know. He clarifies and continues to reveal, even to us, right, who he is and what he's calling us to be. He goes on. They did not need to know the fundamentals of physics, chemistry, and biology to believe that God set everything up to function the way it does now. Again, doesn't mean that those things aren't important. Continue to pay attention in your physics, chemistry, and biology classes. Those are all important things. Don't take that away from what I'm preaching this morning. Okay? It's not that you, we don't knew, need those. It's to understand who God was. They didn't need an, a greater understanding there. And that he presides over the moment-by-moment -moment operation of the cosmos. In fact, our scientific understanding often hinders our belief of this important truth. And you've probably, I've been there myself sometimes, right? I, I want to have answers. I need the black and white. I got to be able to figure it out. I, I need to know. And it's important to know. But big picture, God is working from the beginning to dwell amongst us, to dwell amongst his people, for us to be able to know that we, you did not happen by chance. He created you, and he created us to bring him honor and glory. Colossians chapter 1 Verses 16 and 17 go on to talk um, some more about this. So, and I read this two weeks ago. I'm only going to read part of it. But I'm also, I only put verses 1, excuse me, verses, verse 16 up there. And really you need 16 and 17. So um, I'll read it for you and you can check it out later too. It says, for in him, so in, for in Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And now here's verse 17, the verse I should have put up there that, that ties it together. It says this, Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. If God is not involved in the creation as we see it right now, 
we cease to exist. Did you, did you realize that? Have you thought about that re recently? That's what Paul says in the book of Colossians. It is only because of him that you and I are here today and that all of this holds together. This is not based on who we are. So from creation and the beginning, through Adam and Eve, Abraham, Jacob, all the way into the when they were there in Egypt and then were in captivity and were slaves, God is at work. He is speaking and engaging with his people. And we see it there. Again, what did Moses have when, when he went to the burning bush? Did he have the New Testament? No. Did he have the Old Testament? No. Did he have the law yet at the burning bush? No. What did he know about God? Only the things that God had come to him and spoken to him about. So as he stood there at the bur burning bush, he was again revealing himself to Moses and saying, you can trust me. You can trust me. Some of us need those burning bush moments, don't we, in order to step out in faith? Especially if you think of someone at those days and age when there's no law that's been revealed. There's no, there's no Old Testament or New Testament that has been given yet. And that leads us to our second point, which is as God worked in Moses' life, Israel was taken out of captivity. Israel was taken out of captivity. Now I have a rhetorical question. Don't answer it out loud, because if you do, there's a chance you're going to be embarrassed. And so I'm just telling you it's a trick question ahead of time. And that is, who led Israel out of Egypt? Don't answer it. Okay? It's not Moses. Okay? It's not Moses. Moses was the person, the leader here on earth that, that God worked through. He spoke to him at the burning bush. He's the one that went and talked to Pharaoh. But check this out in Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. It says, as Israel was leaving Egypt by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a, power, in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God guided Moses and the children of Israel as they left Egypt. They left Egypt and they were headed towards the Red Sea and God was guiding them. He went before them. And when they got to the Red Sea and they, they couldn't get through there and he was guiding them and they saw God literally lead them up to the Red Sea and then they see the Egyptians coming behind them. You know what they said to Moses? Why did you lead us out here to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? Were there not enough headstones there? Did, did you need the whole desert and were to bury us? Is that why you brought us out here? Because we'd be better off back there. We'd be better off back there. And yet, this is then what God did. Chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, right thereafter, it says, Then the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew... And went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood between them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Is that amazing? You know, it's one thing to sit there and think about that. I mean, I, I can't really totally comprehend a cloud going in front of me during the day and then there being a pillar of fire at night. That's one thing. But then it says, when they needed the provision, right? God was guiding them. When he provided for them, that same cloud on one side was dark so that the Egyptians couldn't see them. And on the other side, it was light so that they could pass through the Red Sea. God was in their midst. He did not leave them alone. He went with them. He guided and he protected them as he went. Again, here we see God interacting with his people and we don't have the Ten Commandments yet. We don't have the Old Testament yet. We don't have the New Testament yet. He's revealing himself. And as he continued to reveal himself, we come to the tabernacle. Now, God gave, had to give them instructions as to what the tabernacle would look like. Tabernacle was a building that they could tear down and put back up as they traveled from Egypt to the Promised Land. And God continued to reveal himself. And remember, no law yet. They had just left Egypt. They had passed through the Red Sea, and they came to Mount Sinai. How holy is the God that you serve? How holy is him? Do you have a grasp on how holy God is? 
Take a look at this. This is God again revealing himself to the people, uh, to, the, to the children of Israel. In Exodus 19, 11 to 12, it says, on that day, then this is when God's gonna re- give the 10 commandments to Moses, when he's gonna give him his law. It says, on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. You might read that and say, God's a really mean God, right? He wants to have all these rules so you don't touch this and you can't do that and all those kind of things. This is an incredibly loving God. Here here is a God who is holy and perfect. And he says, when he's on top of the mountain, you can't even touch the bottom of it. Is that amazing? Here here he is. Moses is going to go up there. And God says, the people need to stay back because when you're in my presence, you also need to be holy. And that means don't touch the mountain. Don't touch the mountain. That's what he told them to to not do. Don't touch the mountain. While he was there, he was given the Ten Commandments. And so much more than that. He was given instructions. You can read the book of Leviticus. You can, and it talks about the Levites. You can, it talks about the, the tabernacle, a place for God's presence to reside amongst the people. That was the purpose of the tabernacle. It was a place within the nation, as they were traveling, where God could come down and reside. Instructions on sacrifice, offering, priests, food, festivals. As we're talking about this tabernacle, you need to get out of your mind a picture of this church because it was complete opposite of this church. Okay? A tabernacle that, they were, that was there in their midst and this church building are not the same. It was not a place where large groups came and gathered on a weekly basis. That is not what the tabernacle was. The people were not allowed to go to the middle. Okay? They had to stay way out on the outside. So here we are in the sanctuary. We talk about coming all together here. In the, this is where God is meeting us. No, you knew we need to get that out of, our, out of our minds in that perspective compared to the tabernacle. The inside of the tabernacle was off limits to the people. That's where the priests went. And in fact, I have a, a, a diagram here for you, and it, it comes out of that same Old Testament Today um, book Uh, that I'm using for my class, and it talks about the fact that there was a sacred compass. Now, before you you ask or start thinking that that's exactly how the Israel's camp was set up, it wasn't in perfect circles, okay? It's just a compass to give you an idea of of what that looks like. And these are zones, okay, that we'll talk about here, zones one through five. Zone, Zone one would be the people that aren't Israelites. So everyone else was outside of the campgrounds, Okay, that's zone one. Their enemies, uh, the other nations that lived around them, and then sometimes there were people that, that were called impure and were sent outside the camp, and that's in zone one. Zone two was inside the camp. So if you're in zone two, anywhere from there in, that's where the people lived. That's, that's where they had protection, and that's where the Jewish people were at. Zone three would have been the courtyard, The courtyard is where sacrifices and purification took place. There was an altar there. Zone four was the antechamber, and that's where the priests were allowed to go into. And then zone five, okay, zone five was the holiest of holies within the tabernacle. And within that, it wasn't all the priests could go into zone five. No, only the high priest could go into uh, zone five, and only once per, per year. The closer you get to the middle to where the holiest of holies is, the more rules and regulations about purity are. It's kind of like if you're a heart surgeon and you're amongst the people each and every day, right? You go to the hospital, and I don't know if you've been in the hospital recently, but you put your, everywhere you go, you can put that stuff on your hands, right, that makes, gets rid of the germs, right? You, they're obsessed with germs for some reason at a, at a hospital. So you, the, you get to the hospital and you, and, you, and you cleanse your hands, right? Even if you're just going to visit someone. Then you take another step in there and you, let's say you're getting ready to go into surgery. It's freezing cold in that room. Be, right before you go into surgery, right? If you've gone in there and, and you, your loved one's preparing to go, you take a coat with you. It doesn't matter what time of year. Why is it so cold in there? They're trying to kill the germs. See, they don't want the germs growing in there. So again, there's, there's another level of, of, of germ-free zone. Then you, you walk into the, into the surgery uh, center, and 
in the Dominican Republic, where they don't have the rules like we have here, I was in there. Uh, they didn't let me get close to the patient. But you go in there, I've seen, they have, they're, you know, they're covered. They're covered. And the guy, the surgeon who's doing that, he's, he's all scrubbed down and got all, he's covered from head to toe. And there's only one guy, right, that's going in there and working, let's say it's heart surgery, working on that heart surgery. And, and he doesn't even touch and get those instruments. The nurses hand it to him. And every, when you get down to when somebody's sticking their hand inside of you, right, you want it germ-free. And so there's, it's, that's kind of an example of, of what uh, God was showing to the people of Israel is that as you get closer and closer to me, we need to look at the purity. We need to, you need to take a good look at yourself because I am holy. This is who I am. Again, we've talked about the law. The law defines who God is. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. The priests were the ritual experts. They kept, made sure people were clean or that the, that the uh, priests were clean. They had the standards of purity. Again, the book of Leviticus, if you want to take some time to read that, we're not doing that this morning. They also were the, the gatekeepers. So they were the one, you know how at the hospital they have those doors where you push the button and then they, sometimes they'll open up for you. Or other times there'll be people there that say, no, you can't go in there. You can, right? They want to keep things germ-free. Levites, that's what they were doing. They were the gatekeepers that would allow people in and out of these different areas, these different zones that they had there. All of this moving from the idea that zone one, there is chaos and impurity, as you move towards the middle, there is purity and there is order. Again, reflecting back to what God revealed to us through his creation. Under the old covenant, God revealed and said, I'm going to work in and through you. This is how you can be holy and pure in, in, in my sight. Through the law, through the temple, he continued to show that, always with the promise that there's a Savior that's coming. Always saying, there's a Messiah there's a Messiah. Continue to follow and, and work through this, this uh, spiritual compass, but there's a Savior that's coming. I promise you that. I promise you that. And that brings us to, to the Messiah. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh, so that is, God became flesh and made his dwelling. There's that word, right? He came to dwell in our midst. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. It went from being creation to a cloud and a pillar of fire. He came and dwelt within the tabernacle and now he's here in a human body as the Messiah. The Gospels reflect Jesus' life here on earth. He fulfilled the law. He was an answer to the old covenant. It's not that the old covenant was bad. It was just that it was, it's called old because it's from farther back. The payment was made. It was perfect. How can I, how can I confidently tell you that the old covenant was fulfilled? How can I confidently tell you that we no longer have to have these zones? Why don't we have these zones anymore? Have you thought about that in the last five minutes? Why, why don't we have to go through these purification rites, all of those sacrifices? Why aren't we doing those things? Because this is what it says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 51. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it says this, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Between the outside, again going back to those zones, between the outside and the holiest of holies, God split the curtain. God split the curtain. He says, you have free access into my presence. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's the holiest of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, what can we do? Let us draw near to God. We're not stuck out in the courtyard. We're going straight to the Holy of Holies, the place only the high priest could go one time a year. The curtain was, was ripped, and it says here, because of Christ's body, that curtain was opened up and we can draw near to God. Isn't that awesome? Straight into his presence. 
That's good news not just for Israel, but also for Gentiles. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, it talks about how this, this salvation is not just for the, the Jews, but also for us that are Gentiles. And in fact, in, in verse 22, it says, and in him, that is Jesus, you too are being built together, so that is the Jews and the Gentiles, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Again, that word dwelling, dwelt. And where is that taking place? No longer in the tabernacle. It says that that dwelling is taking place in you and I by the power of his spirit. And that leads us to our last point, which is head, heart, and hands. God has dwelt among us from the beginning. He's been amongst his creation. It's looked different ways at different times. As a disciple, if you've given your life to him, it says here that he dwells in us. 1 Peter 2.9, talking about you and I as, as followers of Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. He calls you the priests. You're the gatekeepers that allow things in and out of your life that are called to make this sacred space that is within us holy. We have that responsibility. He's given that to you. Why? Do we deserve it? No. It's because we have a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. His grace allows us to have that opportunity. All of life has the opportunity to be worship. John 4, 21, Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman, and the Samaritan woman was talking about where Samaritans worshipped and where, and where Jewish people worshipped. And Jesus responds to her and as they're talking about where to go and worship. And he says, you know, there's a time that's coming where you won't go where the Samaritans worship on the mountain, and you're not going to go to Jerusalem where the Jewish people worship, but you're going to worship in spirit and truth. I'm here to remind you this morning that that is the time that we live in. The time when it's not going to the mountain, it's not going to Jerusalem, but the space where you're at, right now, where you're sitting, the places where you will go, we worship in spirit and in truth. As a disciple, if you've given your life to Christ, you are sacred space. Will you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the blood that was shed so that we might walk into the holies of holies. Lord, so many times I take for granted the fact that even right now I can come directly to you. I, I can walk before you. I can stand before you as a sinner. I take that for granted. It's only through the power and the, and the work of Jesus Christ. What an amazing picture you have painted through Scripture of, of who you are. Not just your holiness, but your great love and grace that you offer to us. Lord, you have, you have set aside you have set aside those things that we live out, the sin in our lives, when we accept and trust in the work of Jesus Christ. I praise you, Lord, for that. Lord, our, our time here this morning is a time of worship, whether we're singing, even now as we give our tithes and offerings. Again, Lord, that, that's a time of worship, of saying thank you for all that you've given us, of reflecting that space within us that you dwell, that temple that you call us. Lord, our desire is, is to show that love, that relationship with you through all the things that we say and do. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.